Do you ever wonder how great leaders in the community make things happen? When they encounter new unexpected challenges like a pandemic, how do they continue to successfully make an impact? Welcome to That Sounds Terrific, the podcast that connects you with these amazing people. Get insights on what they do to meet their goals. Find out how you can help them in their mission and learn their methods so you can be more successful at what you do. Welcome to That Sounds Terrific with host Nick Koziel. Well, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of That Sounds Terrific. Joining me today is Kristen Wazdak, founder and chief behavior detective at Behavior Works of Southwestern PA. I'm your host, Nick Koziel. I'm so happy to have you on this episode, uh, Kristen. Um, we were just chatting last week, and I just love the things that you're doing and, and some of the things you're planning on doing. So um, why don't you tell you, the audience just a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you for having me because I appreciate the opportunity to share my passion with the world and you provided a vehicle for that. So thank you for being who you are and doing what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so my business is Behavior Works of Southwestern PA. So my primary passion is educating early intervention professionals and related mental health professionals about holistic approaches to behavior. So it's all about teaching how does nutrition pay, play a role in behavior? How does vision play a role in behavior? How does being born via C-section and disruptions in the gut and having mold in your house or lead paints or any of those things, how do they cause behavior? So really trying to get people to look at those things because I want people to have better results while they're working with kids so they're less burnout. We have better outcomes for kids, better outcomes for families. And we spend less on those programs because they're more efficient. Um, and so I have been doing that for probably a dedicated effort for about the last year. I started in January of last year. <laughs> I had three people show up to a training. Uh, it was a, it was divine intervention, I think, because it was a in Greensburg here in southwestern Pennsylvania at a in a basement um, of a church. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> what better place to start than a house of God? Right. Um, and so I've grown my business. It's still just me. I'm looking to uh, probably hire another person this week to help with advertising, marketing, content management, and pushing more trainings out on like the teachable platform just so that I can reach a bigger audience. Um, but to grow my business and um, start the nonprofit that we had talked about too. So, so, so yeah, tell me a little bit about the nonprofit too, because we talked about it, but the audience doesn't know anything about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so my vision is to create a nonprofit um, that solves two of the main problems that I see in early intervention. And it happens in other systems as well, but a lot of families that have children with special needs eventually have to be gluten-free and dairy-free in their diet. Right. And May is Celiac uh, Disease Awareness Month. For those of mm -hmm. you who didn't know, I just posted some information to my Facebook and LinkedIn um, and my YouTube channel, but to bring more awareness to that. But because more people have to be gluten-free and dairy-free, that can be really expensive. Mm -hmm. And for families that are on, let's say, SNAP benefits, EBT benefits, um, it can be quite a challenge to meet those needs. So the purpose of the nonprofit is twofold, to help those families get access to gluten-free, dairy-free, whole organic foods, but also to help them pay for out-of-pocket medical expenses, which as I see it are the two biggest barriers to success uh, from overcoming behavioral issues in those kids. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, and, and you know, the barriers to access are, are usually what also helps that sort of like domino effect of, you know, um, families having a harder time, um, you know, helping their kids develop. And then you get the behavioral issues, you get the, you know, harder challenges to learn and, and, and things like that. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how you sort of assess those those um, issues that are that are kind of arising in our in our youth and education. Sure. So one of the major things is that aut kids with autism and ADHD, based on covd.org, that's the College of Optometrics and Vision Development, they perceive that something like 
40% of those kids are more likely to have vision issues that are going undetected. Mm -hmm. And general vision assessments are missing 50 or 60% of the vision problems we have in general in our population. So um, the easiest thing to do to assess for, it's easier to do in older kids, but even if you just have an object that you can hold in front of your kiddo's eyes, have them hold their head still and just see if they can track with their eyes moving smoothly from left to right. And they can do that up and down just in a small circle to see if their eyes are working together. Those are called smooth pursuits. So mm -hmm. you can also do something called psychotic eye movements by just having them look here and then over here. You can also do that with like a lighted little pen or flashlight right. um, just to see if they can move their eyes back and forth. Yeah, you were doing that really well, by the way, for those that can't see Thank this. You. Thank I you. was not following it at all. I'm just sort of staring into the camera. <laughs> so maybe I need some help already. And we were talking a little earlier, even before we started recording about, you know, nutrition in general, like trying to squeeze in meals and, and whatnot. Um, and I know I am very often um, eating on the go or not eating at all for hours and hours and then finally, you know, eating. Um, what kind of... Uh, what kind of role does that play in, in early development? You know, eating, yeah. like bulge eating, like what's that word? Not bulge eating, but like eating a lot at one time and then not during the rest of the day or like what so do you- So in, in regards to what you're talking about, a lot of, in my training, I'll take a step back a minute. We sure. talk about, there's actually eight sensory systems in our body. We have our common ones, our smell, touch, taste, but we also have three that are called the vestibular system, the interoceptive system, and our proprioceptive system. So our proprioceptive system is just receptors that live in our muscles, joints, and our tendons. And our vestibular system gives us information about where we are in space and time, our head position. Our interoceptive system gives us awareness about the inside of our body and how we're feeling, like our heart rates, or if we have to go to the bathroom, or if we're feeling hungry. And so, so many of these kids, they will eat a lot all at once right? Um, and just want to eat, 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 eat because the parts of their body, they're on off switches for certain things are either always on or always off. Mm -hmm. And so they can't really say that they're hungry because they don't feel it. Um, and so you get some of these strange eating behaviors in a lot of these kids. Yeah. Um, in regards to eating in general, I have so many kids in early intervention that have reflux. Right. That generally what happens is that when I refer them to a developmental pediatrician who then assesses for blood work, we find that they actually have a gluten and or a dairy intolerance or some other intolerance that's actually causing the reflux. Right. But what I'm trying to bring more awareness to is that by putting them on reflux medicine that affects their ability to digest foods properly which can lead to nutritional deficiencies but never addresses the original problem of a gluten or dairy intolerance so whenever you're not getting to the root cause of that problem and the kid is still having reflux issues maybe mm -hmm. that you know they're putting re reflux meds but maybe there's still some issues there when kids are having reflux it affects their behavior because they want to stay in a certain position because they know if they move a lot, they're going to throw up and that's going to burn them. Right. So now you get kids that don't want to move mm -hmm. and they're not developing motor patterns of behavior. They're not developing through, you know, rolling and crawling and cruising along furniture and walking because they know that it hurts to move. Right. But by having a greater awareness around okay, maybe this kiddo needs to be on a dairy-free formula. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if mom is breastfeeding, that she needs to be more mindful of what she eats because then you really get to the root cause. So that's mm -hmm. why I take a holistic approach to all of this because until you solve the root cause of that behavior, it's really, I don't want to say ineffective, but it creates right. an inefficient system where maybe that practitioner is getting burnout because they're using all the tricks of the trade that they know but you're not really getting to the heart of the problem. So yeah. there's a lot of issues that we deal with around feeding and. Right. Well, you're like, you're sort of like 
responding to the symptoms rather than to the, the cause of the symptoms. So you're just exactly. kind of like, yeah, so I get it. So it's, they're always going to be on that medication because you're not going to really get to what the root of the problem is. And I know with some of the diseases are, or conditions that, you know, um, you deal with, like you mentioned celiacs, like it, you often don't find out that that's the actual problem until way, way, way into like adulthood, you know, sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so what are some of the methods that you, you do use to help um, people identify those things earlier? Well, you can go to celiac.org to okay. find more information. You can do a survey. Um, finding out just what is gluten and what is dairy. Um, if people think that that is a problem for them, they can go to celiac.org and fill out those assessments. There's resources out there. Mm-hmm. But for people that are curious about it, you can also do something called a food mood diary. And this is for some of the parents that I've talked to before, or older children, do a food mood diary. So just keep a list of everything that you eat or and drink for three days mm-hmm. and see how you feel afterwards. You know, if you're getting diarrhea or vomiting or some people get bloating or in my own kids, we just got blood work back last week that they have to be gluten-free and dairy-free. Mm-hmm. So whenever, even for myself, I have to be gluten-free and dairy-free. So personally, like whenever I eat gluten, when I wake up the next morning, I'm more irritable and more agitated. In my kids, um, I see it in the form of like more OCD behaviors right. that they're kind of very rigid. Um, and so it, it comes out as behavior, right? When right. it's really, it's really not behavior. It's the biochemistry of their body that's altered that we need to really work as a team. It's not to discredit any one silo of approaches, right? It's how can we all work together to help this kid? It's not like, mm-hmm. let's fight amongst ourselves, <laughs> right? It's like, let's really take a good look at everything that could be going on with these kids asking the right questions, making the right referrals, and then creating some interventions in the meantime to create long-term success for that kid and those families. Yeah. You know, and when I first started talking to you, what I found interesting was like, you know, I had never thought about some other underlying um, things that could be causing behavioral issues. You know, you, you have, you know, my wife is a teacher and, you know, I was studying to be a teacher for a while. And when you, when you interact with certain types of kids, you're like, well, why are they that way? You know? Um, and that's just something that never popped into my head that it could have to do with diet it could have to do with, you know, um, those types of things. So, you know, one of the reasons I, I asked you to be on, on the show was I'm like, I know that there are a lot of people that just don't realize that. And there's parents out there you know, that might not know why their child is acting the way they're acting and some of the behavioral things have come up, but also some of the, just the warning signs, mm-hmm. um, you know, that you described to me um, or, or in our earlier conversation. Um, can you talk a little bit about like some of those things that, you know, we were, we were chatting about as far as early warning signs and, yeah. um, and how to the- identify? One of the things that we had talked about specifically that comes to mind is C-section birth. So, and there's a lot of information on PubMed um, that talks about um, the gut microbiome. So just in simple terms, if, you're, if you don't pass through the vaginal canal for birth, you're not exposed to the vaginal flora. And there's implications to be more likely to have celiac disease and to have asthma and to have some different problems. Because when you pass through that vaginal canal, that flora inundates all our mucosal membranes. So it's going into our eyes, our ears, our nose, it's going down into our stomachs Mm -hmm. and our intestines. And so you have to maintain a good balance of good and bad bacteria because that's our immune response. That's how we digest food. And that, you know, there are certain processes that human DNA cannot do that we're reliant on that symbiotic relationship with gut bacteria. Right. And so when you don't have enough gut bacteria, you have problems with immune function. You have problems with, you know, digesting foods completely, breaking down foods and using them efficiently. Mm -hmm. Um, But another thing that we talked about too, related to that is like allergies and tolerances and sensitivities. When you have, when you're eating like gluten and dairy or things that you're allergic to consistently, it can cause a breakdown in your epithelial barrier in your stomach. 
Right. So the epithelial cells are just basically, you know, the cell wall of your stomach. And mm -hmm. so whenever you have a breakdown in that, it leads to leaky gut. And leaky gut just means that things that should be in your stomach and intestines are now getting into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And those can be like long chain amino acids from gluten that can then start to cause autoimmunity. It can be um, Lyme from Lyme's disease. It can be strep B bacteria that causes pandas. So that's like autism like symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so, so much human disease and disorder is related to imbalances in gut bacteria and the mm -hmm. brain, which right. brings me to the other aspect of C-section. So it's not just about the gut, the vaginal flora. You have to go through certain movement patterns to be born. Mm -hmm. And you know, your head is pushing up and your shoulders are moving together. So for those that are interested in looking, it would be primitive reflexes. So they can become unintegrated at any time in our lives, mm -hmm. but they're involuntary movement patterns that we have to kind of, it's like Jenga blocks, that as we grow in age, we go through these movement patterns. And as we get higher level movement patterns, it inhibits the, the, the slower level movements. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these kids, you can find charts online just primitive reflex charts that talk about, you know, if you, if you, like, if you pretend like you're striking a match and you go up the one side, the, the kid's spine, and they kind of have this movement to the side, mm -hmm. that's a primitive reflex that's been retained. And so those are the kids that can't sit still <laughs> in school because their shirts rubbing up against them. And the teacher says, just sit still, just do it. Right. And it's so much of this behavior, Nick, is about, it's not that the kid won't do it. It's that they can't, they cannot do the things that we're asking them to do. Right. And so by not taking a holistic approach, we're limiting their abilities and kind of keeping them caught in their own bodies. Mm -hmm. So looking at things holistically is, is that's the way of the future. So. Well, it's very interesting. And, you know, who'd have thought that all these things are connected and that something that happened so long ago could affect, you know, a child much later in life. Um, you know, I, I definitely didn't, didn't know any of this. And that's why I'm like, what? Uh -huh. <laughs> so how did you get into researching all this and really kind of, um, you know, this is sort of almost like a passion, right? Mm -hmm. So like, how did that develop for you? Um. I, well, we have to go way back for that. I was sure. in third grade and my teacher at the time had asked for volunteers for kids that wanted to take their recess time and go next door. Mm -hmm. And next door was the special needs classroom. And uh, I volunteered mm -hmm. <laughs> and I kind of never looked back. There was kids in wheelchairs and um, I remember playing cards. I have a visual memory. I remember playing cards with um, another student that was in a wheelchair and just the smile that it brought to their face, mm -hmm. just simple interactions and things that we can do to bring such joy to other people with special needs. Right. Um, so it all started back then, but really as I went through my degree, I went to Penn State for my undergrad in human development and family studies. Mm -hmm. And then my master's was in applied behavior analysis. So applied behavior analysis is all about looking at observable and measurable be behaviors. Mm -hmm. And my undergrad was looking at, well, this is how the inside of the body matures. And this is the inside of, of the inner workings of a human. So it was very conflicting, if right. you will. So it's like, this is everything on the outside and this is everything on the inside. And as I was um, working in early intervention for the last six years on multidisciplinary teams, so it was like OTs and PTs and nutritionists and everybody was, they had their own approach. Um, and I saw that some of my colleagues were getting burnt out and I'm like, well, you all have valid points. Let's see how we can work together. And so I just started researching like, Okay, what does a nutritionist do? What does an occupational therapist do? How is uh, how do I as a behaviorist create something that's a measurable, observable assessment for that problem so that I can integrate it into my practice and then tell other people about it? Mm -hmm. 
And so really it started in third grade, but it's just blossomed because I just have this really big interest in, in helping people. Um, and I'll share a personal bit of information last week. Um, I was actually told that I'm borderline, um, high functioning autism. (laughs) (laughs) So um, it it fits well because I've always had issues with like gluten sensitivities Mm -hmm. and dairy sensitivities and, uh, personal relationships. So it's kind of like, if you really want to know how you look in that outfit, I'll tell you, (laughs) (laughs) but it's, it's been my passion. It's kind of like when, and everybody on the spectrum is a little bit different, but my focus has been on autism Mm -hmm. and looking at the biochemistry of the body and truly how can we create a holistic experience. So through not just um, my professional journey, it's been a personal passion of mine because the dietary changes helped affect my behavior and my interactions with my family. So Right, right. And, you know, you, you have an interesting perspective, because I don't think there's a lot of people that have like done the the internal study and, you know, the what we might call the external study as far mm-hmm. as looking at the whole human holistically, like you're saying, it's like you have specialists in one area, but maybe not the other. And from what you're describing, there's just a lot of like symbiosis between the two that both affect each other, you know, it's mm-hmm. kind of like, uh, important that you have someone like yourself that can kind of actively read both sides and have experienced both sides. Um, you know, am I correct in that assumption where there aren't a lot of people that are doing what you do or? Right. Yeah. And I'd like to create more of that. Right. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I would like to be able to, and there are people out there that are doing it and they're, you know, they're creating content, but sometimes it's dismissed mm-hmm. and it's almost trying to convince people to buy into science which is peculiar because right. it's science, you know, for me, there seems to have been a lot of that lately yeah. <laughs> buying into yeah. science in general. Um, but, so there have been people that have done it before, but it's kind of like, it, it's maybe time for another generation to step forward and do it mm-hmm. with more passion and purpose and, and just keep pushing. Um, because there's just such small modifications, just like I played cards with that kiddo with right. special needs in third grade just such small modifications, Nick, like if we could get OBs to be more cognizant about having conversations with new moms that have just Mm -hmm. had C-sections about the implications that, you know, that absence of the vaginal flora will have on their kiddos gut microbiome, Mm -hmm. but also having an awareness for those OBs about primitive reflexes having those conversations and just maybe handing them a piece of paper or something. When you have a baby, it's, it's a lot, you know, my son was, my son was born at 33 weeks in two days. So he was, he's, he has his own challenges, but, but going through that, you're overwhelmed, but making sure that the OB would even, you know, follow up with that family at a visit when they have a one-on-one with their mom, with the mom Mm -hmm. um, and have those conversations or to make, coursework more rigorous around nutrition for pediatricians right and to talk to um, families about you know when they give their kiddos antibiotics to make sure that they give pre and probiotics to restore that gut bacteria Mm -hmm. it's just very small things yeah no and and i'm sure that they're you know pediatricians have to read a lot of of information on, on a variety of different things and you know they have to sort of be experts in all forms of medicine and know how to refer and, and whatnot. So uh, you can, you, there's a good reason I'm not a pediatrician. <laughs> there's probably a, a bunch of good reasons um, because I love learning, but retaining all of that, I, I think would, I, would be a challenge for me. Um, but in, are there artificial ways to like, you know, restore some of that when you have a C-section? Are there, you know, therapies or anything that you can do earlier on uh, that you're aware of that um, might, might help that situation? Yeah. So there are, and this is something that has to be researched and you have to consult with um, your OB and other medical professionals, but there are researchers out there that are actually swabbing babies. So after they have been born, they're working with the OB and the delivery team and everything. 
that they are very carefully swabbing babies after they're born with the mother's vaginal flora. Okay. So if it's a C-section baby, they will very carefully go through and make sure that the baby is coated Mm -hmm. because then they get that vaginal flora. So there are different ways that you can do that. Or, you know, they're, now they make pre and probiotics for infants yeah. and toddlers. So there before. are things out there. They're over the counter, but you want to make sure that you're finding something that's high quality. Right. Talking with medical, medical professionals and getting something that's right for you. Yeah. As with anything that you're, you know, ingesting or putting in your bodies, make sure that it's the right thing, you know, talk yeah. to the, talk to the expert. So yes, yes. Um, <laughs> that's very important. Um, you know, going back to the the autism and, and and children on the spectrum, you know, some of my personal experiences with friends, um, children, you know, in general, sometimes getting them to eat anything at all is is extremely difficult. You know, I, I'm thinking of uh, of one one person in particular where you know they would only eat things that were really crispy in texture, nothing soft. So um, you know, having to basically bake the heck out of stuff to make sure it was crispy enough um you know do you see things that resulted in that or you know do do you know where i'm getting at like are there yeah so it's the same rigidity and that's that same like ocd behaviors wanting to control the situation rigidity in eating Mm -hmm. but some of it has to do with like primitive reflexes like we talked about right like there's a rooting reflex that you can test that if you, again, it's like a match strike, just go up the side of the mouth. And if they have just a little twitch here after a certain age, and you can go to the primitive reflex charts and it'll tell you what age that that should be gone by. And I think mm-hmm. it's like six months or something. But if that is a still a persistent problem that that kiddo is going to have maybe drooling, speech and articulation problems, problems chewing, mm-hmm. um, because the mouth, if you think about anatomically, has to get information from the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Right. So for speech, articulation, for eating. And so sometimes it has to do with like a gluten sensitivity mm-hmm. because or a nutritional deficiency. And again, you have to really get blood work to know what's going on in that kiddo's body. Mm -hmm. But the nutritional deficiencies, intolerances, allergies, and sensitivities can create that rigidity, but it can also be caused by that disruption in the overall movement patterns and that progression through those movement, uh, movement patterns known as primitive reflexes. Right. So again, you have to have a team of people that know how to assess for those things and look at those things. So like an OT that specializes in primitive reflexes. Mm -hmm. um, If you think that your kiddo has a vision problem, you can refer to a developmental optometrist that specializes in behavior and working through primitive reflexes. They work with stroke patients, um, you know, patients that have had tumors of all ages. So it's about knowing what questions to ask, who to refer to and what to do. So your organization kind of focuses more on those professionals, right? And how to educate them, not so much the direct client kind of like kiddos, right? Yeah, that's, well, <laughs> I work in early intervention too as a special instructor. Sure. Um, but yes, the, the, what I, the reason I did that is because instead of working from family to family to family, if I can work with a professional that has right. contact with 30 families then that amplifies the effect. Sure. And so it creates a bigger reach. Um, It's just what I'm passionate about. I love working with adults, educating adults about this Mm -hmm. and just creating dynamic, immersive content that people just really, really enjoy. I miss being in person with people. Right. So I'm looking forward (laughs) to get back to that. But right now it's all on Zoom. Yeah. So as, as it, as is a lot of different things. So I know, (laughs) um, no, but I think that that's a great point to make. And and the only reason I ask is because, you know, I want my audience to have the ability to like reach out to you in the right way. So if they're a professional, um, they're more likely to get serviced by you, but I'm sure you have advice for families that are looking for those specific doctors and, and things like that. Um, you know, and I, I'm going to be listing all your contact information and, you know, um, social media and stuff like that in the show notes. So, um, we'll definitely have ways to, to contact you. Um, 
Can we talk a little bit more about the nonprofit? Now, I know that's something that's like on the horizon that you really want to do. Um, what are some of the challenges that you're just facing in getting that started right now? And how might you know some of the listeners uh, be able to help? Yeah, so I'm looking for um, money to help it, you know, get off the, the ground and going. Um, anybody that is passionate about helping start the nonprofit, um, working with that autism community, kids with special needs with behaviors. Um, yeah, but it's basically money and managers, people that mm -hmm. can, you know, work with me that are passionate about it to get everything going. So anybody that has a history in the nonprofit sector, managerial, HR, um, mm -hmm. secretarial, administrative, those things are really, really helpful right now. Yeah, no. I, so I urge any listener to, to reach out to Kristen uh, that might have some information. <laughs> Um, it sounds like somebody that also might have experience in the nonprofit sectors and especially in the medical kind of field or health mm -hmm. and wellness. Um, so that'd be, be very helpful as well. Um, you know, is there anything, I like to always ask this question to make sure that I cover everything that the guest wants to, to talk about. Is there anything that I missed or that you definitely want the audience to know about the things that you're doing or um, I just didn't ask? Yeah, well, I eventually... I have a vision for creating um, a larger organization that focuses on filling some of those gaps. So people that can help with course development, people that can help with policy analysis, um, legislation initiatives, and this is a long-term goal, but I have a, a you know, a long-term vision for how I want to 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 broaden this horizon um but if anybody gets involved be prepared because <laughs> i've been told it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose <laughs> so <laughs> there's a lot that goes into it yeah I'm yeah sure. i i can be pretty intense so um <laughs> yeah but um yeah uh just anybody that's interested in taking that holistic approach that really really help people um yeah, so I have a, a big vision for the future. My my daughter drew. This is the, something I've been talking about during my networking meetings. Is my pick my um, daughter drew. I have the blue bird here. I love blue birds. So my daughter drew it and put it in a bird bath, and she drew a uh, tree here and clouds and the sun. So it's kind of like some people can see the roots that are underneath the tree, but the way that my mind works is I see the roots the tree and the forest. <laughs> and so, um, you know, people that, that are committed and that can have a growth mindset and that are really, really motivated. Um, yeah. No, I, I totally get what you're saying. Cause like when I'm looking at a problem or when I'm looking at a goal or something like that, I see the, the whole big picture. And it sounds like you see even a little bit more than that. You go a little <laughs> bit further. You're like, you know, not only the earth, but I see the galaxy too, mm -hmm. but I, you know, the thing that's different is I also enjoy like putting the puzzle together, you know, and like kind of having those steps of where you get, you know, how do you get to that big, you know, audacious goal and, you know, be successful. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm also hearing in, in everything you're saying is that you, you do have these great goals, but um, you also have already kind of compartmentalized, I can't even say that word, you put them into little compartments and you've already started that. So like, yeah, I want to do, you know, this, I want to do, you know, that and everything will build up to the big, mm -hmm. big picture. Um, so as long as you can look at it from that way, I think you're golden because you can like find the volunteers and you can find, you know, the right hires to help you with those specific things, you know, and running a nonprofit, obviously there, you're always wearing many, many different hats and you're going to be running a nonprofit, but also having like a business that's sort of attached in the same field. So it's going to be, you know, an interesting adventure and, um, like I said, I, I think this is just something that I really want to spread the word about because I think it's important, um, you know, for parents to understand maybe why their why their kid is doing something that they're doing. The you know, same thing with teachers, um, and just kind of having a little, just a little bit more patience, or at least understanding about why some some child is acting up, you know. Um, cause so often we kind of concentrate on the actual behavior and it kind of goes back to what you were saying before we treat the, the symptom, not the root cause. Mm -hmm. Um, so I really think the work that you do is 
very terrific. And oh, thank you. And you know, getting that word out there is really important. And I and hope that my audience can help spread the word about the the very important work that you're you're doing. So thank you, Kristen, for being on the show. Yeah, um, thank you, Nick, for having me. I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to to seeing all those those you know dreams and the nonprofit come to fruition and come true for you. So uh, thanks again so much. Thanks. Take care. Thank you for joining us in another episode of That Sounds Terrific. Don't forget to check out the show notes and our website at thatsoundsterrific.com to find the contact information and the best ways to volunteer with the organizations that we feature. If you know someone that is doing terrific things and think they should be featured in a future episode, be sure to email us their name, contact info, and short description of what they're doing at thatsoundsterrific at gmail.com. If you like our show, give us a five-star our rating and give us some social media love by liking our Facebook page that sounds terrific follow us on Twitter at sounds terrific too and Instagram at sounds terrific we love hearing your feedback on how to make our show sound even more terrific till next time